Yes, thank you. So we are having this uh, talk in conjunction with uh, 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 the, the, our insurance medical scheme. And uh, therefore, I'll, I'll start off uh, the meeting and then I'll give the chair of uh, the medical insurance scheme, uh, Buonaroy, to take us through uh, the next step and introduce our speaker so that we don't eat much into the time. I would like us uh, to start off with uh, um, uh, a Bible verse uh, that keeps me going very much. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 18 to 19. It says, I have seen their ways and I will heal them. I will lead them and give comfort to them. And to those who mourn for them, and those who mourn for them, I will create the right words. Shalom, shalom to those far off and those nearby. Says Adonai, I will heal them. This gives me a lot of um, uh, confidence that the Lord is there to give us health, that the Lord is there to heal us, and that the Lord is there to guide us. And more so uh, with these virtual engagements, we ensure that our members are uh, well equipped with knowledge. And just that, like the Bible says, that we need this knowledge to. Uh, go forward. So let us all bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this evening thanking you for this virtual engagement. We thank you uh, for the PCA Sukari Parish. We thank you, Lord, for every member represented herein. We thank you even for all our friends who are not members of our church who have joined us tonight. And we ask you, the Lord, even as we have this health of virtual engagement, that dear Lord, you will uh, be with us, you will guide our speaker, that everything that will be uh, taught to us tonight, the Lord, it will be uh, for the betterment of our health, and Lord, even for us to be better members uh, of our community, to serve you well, and the Lord, we will be able to achieve our purpose in this earth that you have called us to do. We do pray all this, trusting in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So at this moment, I would like to invite uh, Buana Roy to take over the session. Welcome, uh, Chairman Roy. Thank you, Dr. Shen, and uh, good evening to you all, and praise God, Karibu Sana, to this uh, online engagement. We have with us, our panel is already uh, ready. We have uh, uh, our representatives from uh, IIC consultants, that is uh, Regina Nyokabi. We have Dr. Diana Gekonyo uh, from Kenyan Alliance, and also Tracy Wanjiko from Kenyan Alliance. They're with us. And I will now ask them to introduce to us our main speaker, who is not new to us because he was with us in our last engagement. But yet again, it was always good to, uh, for those who may not have been with us, uh, to have that introduction. So, Karibu uh, Kenyan Alliance, uh, please introduce our main speaker. Hey, good morning, uh, good evening, everyone. Sorry, <laughs> I've gotten used to morning meetings. Uh, it's a pleasure to be to be here with you, and um, thank you for everyone. Uh, there's quite a number of us who've logged in, and uh, it, it's 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 quite a good audience. And, um, I don't, I would like to recognize our intermediary, uh, Regina. Regina, say hi <laughs> to to our. I think they know you, but you can just say something. Maybe say hi, then now we introduce Dr. so that we don't waste okay. a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, members. Uh, thank you so much for the, this uh, invite. We are pleased to have the talk. Like uh, we, are, we are pleased to have the talk. And uh, I want to thank you in advance, uh, Dr. Shem, uh, the chairman, for organizing this. And also, Dr. Sam, if you for asking to honor the, the talk. 
Okay, thank you, Regina. Uh, without further ado, I would want to, uh, to welcome Dr. Mosheru. Thank you for even uh, creating time to just have uh, a talk with our with our team, and uh, you're not new to them, so yeah, Karibu sana, Dr. Yeah, good day, good evening, everyone. Yeah, so uh, so first of all, I want to thank you all because of giving me another opportunity to be here. We were together not too long ago, I think uh, maybe a month or so ago, and maybe, maybe two or three months ago. And I want to believe that uh, that talk was helpful. And I want to ask to again talk about uh, the topic for discussion this evening. And I'm hoping that uh, at least the next 20, 30 minutes, we are going to exchange a few things, ideas, and so forth. Much of what I'm going to pre be presenting is what you already know, but it's always good for us to be reminded uh, because our, our, our brains work best when we uh, repeat things and then, you know, maybe one or two of us are going to be helped by, by this talk tonight, if, if not all of us. So I want to thank you all for making time for this talk. I think I'm going to talk for 30 minutes and then we will have a 10 to 15 minutes Q&A and by 9 p.m. Uh, we should be uh, winding up the talk. Okay, so today we are going to be delving into the topic about uh, cancer. We shall be looking at various aspects of uh, cancer, uh, some of the signs and symptoms, uh, what are some of the ways we can prevent ourselves? What are some of the screening um, modalities that we have? So these are basically some of the things that we are going to uh, talk about. There's many things I'm going to talk about, but I'm probably going to highlight a few which are going to be our main uh, take-home messages. Uh, I want us to start by asking ourselves, what is cancer? So is cancer, are, the, are, are these foreign cells? Are these, uh, you know, cells that uh, do not, you know, are not growing? These interacting cells, this lack of cells. What, what is it? I know we have a good understanding of cancer, uh, but I just wanted to throw this out there for us to be able to stir our, our minds and sort of think about what exactly cancer is. And cancer is basically uncontrolled cell, cell growth. If we were to define it very, very simply we would say that this is uncontrolled cell growth. So in our bodies, our bodies are in a constant state of, uh, the cells are, are constantly dying and new ones are being formed. And there's a very good control of that process that happens so that uh, you, not have, you don't have a lot of cells dying and, and not enough being replaced, or you don't have a lot of cells being replaced and not enough dying. And that's a very, delicate process that is tightly controlled by the body and so cancer represents a you know a disease where this control goes out of hand where you have cells that do not get controlled as far as their growth is concerned so they overgrow and uh, they start now causing other problems so before a cell can be called a cancerous cell it has to undergo a few changes so these are medical terms so there's a uh, normal cells uh you know in the first you know slide there and then there's uh, these are the cells called uh, these are the medical terms which i'm going to explain shortly but basically this is a process through which cells undergo before they become cancerous so you can see in this uh you know th 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 this slide here you can see the cells are very well uh aligned and then in this second one here, the one that I'm calling hyperplasia, you're having a lot of cells everywhere. So you, you, you have an increase in the number of cells, yeah? And then those cells now become abnormal. If you compare this slide here and this other slide uh, column here, you will see that this one, uh, you know, are deep purple, they are, they're, they're, you know, there's a small organelle inside the cell called a nucleus. It's bigger 
you know, the cells look a bit irregular and so forth. So this is an abnormal cell. It's not yet cancerous, but it's abnormal, okay? And then you have these cells that are cancerous that now are totally abnormal. When you look at their organelles, they are extremely abnormal and they are now, uh, you know, uh, you know, they're not uh, limited by the type of cell. They're actually now getting into uh, other, other, other areas, as you can see, you know, where my pointer is. So basically, before, uh, you know, the cells can become cancerous, they go through all these stages. And uh, the, uh, it is at this, you know, stage here where we, the cells are abnormal, that we do, you know, some of the screening tests. For example, I'll be talking about a pap smear. Uh, you want to detect the cells when they are dysplastic, yeah? By dysplastic, I mean when the cells are abnormal, before they become uh, cancerous, okay? So that's basically how, uh, you know, cells develop and become uh, uh, cancerous cells. Now we have different type of tumors. We have what we call the benign tumors, and then we have what we call the malignant tumors. So when I talk about tumor, think about uh, the cells have overgrown, you know, they, they have, they've sort of, uh, you know, gotten out this, of, the, of that equilibrium where, you know, there's, you know, some cells dying and then a few um, and other cells being formed and you have that loss of that equilibrium and you have a lot of cells growing and not enough dying. So when you, when you have such a, such a, such a situation, it forms a tumor or, or a growth and that growth can either be benign by, when we say benign, it means non-cancerous, so they do not grow, they do not invade other tissues, or the tumors can be cancerous. They invade other tissues, they also spread. An example of a benign tumor is uh, something we call a lipoma. Many of you may have heard of, uh, uh, you know, a swelling in the body where that is fat, fat alone. That, that's called a lip lipoma. And, and that's usually a benign tumor. It doesn't grow into other tissues. It doesn't invade other tissues and it does not spread, okay? And then we have, uh, you know, there, there are lots of examples of malignant tumors, uh, you know, breast cancer and all, the, all those other cancers that we know about. The, when they are cancerous, they can actually invade other tissues and then they can actually spread from the primary site where they were, they, 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 they developed to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, a, a another site that is outside, you know, the primary site where they, they developed. Now, there are different types of uh, cancers. Now, I will not uh, bore you with the details of this, but I just thought I would just mention it. We have different types of cancers depending on the tissues that are affected. So we have things we call carcinomas. Usually these are uh, cancers that begin in cells that cover external or internal organs or glands. So for example, uh, you know, uh, the skin, that's one of the covering, yeah, the, the lining of the, for example, the, the food pipe, yeah, so you may have uh, something called esophageal carcinoma, so that means uh, that is a cancer that has developed from the lining of the food pipe. You may have, uh, uh, you know, a squamous cell carcinoma, for example, or, or carcinoma of the skin, that is, uh, you know, when when the, when there is cancer of, of 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 the skin, which is a tissue that affects that covers uh, uh, the body. Then we have uh, sarcomas. Sarcomas. These are uh, cancers that are affecting what we call the support system of the body. So that's the bone, the connective tissue, the fat, and so forth and so on. You may have heard of things called osteosarcoma. So these are bone cancers and so forth. Then there are other cancers called lymphomas. Lymphomas. Uh, cancers that affect the lymph nodes or the guys, you know, of the body, uh, and that, that basically affect the, the immune system. And then we have the leukemias. The leukemias affect the blood. So you may have uh, blood cancer, that's called leukemia. You may have lymphoma that affects the lymph nodes, and then sarcoma and uh, carcinoma. These are good terms because these are terms that uh, you might hear your doctor uh, talking about to describe you know, a certain disease in, in, in someone. So it's important to uh, sort of know what the doctor is talking about. And then obviously the cancers are named uh, depending on the part of the body that they affect. For example, uh, we have a hepatocellular carcinoma. Hep when, you, when you talk about hepato, it means liver. So hepatocellular means uh, liver cell carcinoma. You may have uh, 
um, you know, for example, myeloma. Myeloma is, 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 has to do with bone marrow. So a lot of this basically is, is these are medical terms, but I just wanted to make the point that uh, uh, the cancers are named according to the tissues that they affect. So cancer spreads, uh, you know, from a primary site. So it will develop in one organ. That's what I'm calling the primary site. And then if it's left untreated, it might then spread into other distant organs. And if you can see this slide here, uh, you might find that the primary cancer, you know, begins in the colon. Uh, you can see there. And then uh, some of those uh, cells, you, you remember I said that cancers cancer cells they invade other tissues so they will invade they will begin in the lining of the of the large large intestine or what we call the colon and then it will invade the other layers of the colon so it will come it will move from the outer layer i mean the the inner layer and it will move to the muscular layer and that it will move to the outer layer and then it will move to the lymph nodes that are adjacent to that uh, large intestine and then after that it might spread to other bits for example it might spread to the lung it might spread spread to the brain it might spread to other other areas and basically how the the cancer spreads usually is through two systems one is through the blood so some of those cancerous cells find themselves in blood tissue and then i mean blood vessels and then that, that blood obviously then transports those cancerous cells to other bits or other parts of the body and when they go to those parts of the body then they uh, seed there and then they start growing and so you have uh, spread to that area and then they also spread through lymph nodes as well so uh, for example if you have the breast cancer it might spread to the lymph nodes within the um, within the armpit and so you might find that the breast has a mass or a, a, a growth and that has spread then to the lymph nodes that are adjacent to it that's around the uh, armpit. So that's what we, when we talk about invasion and metastasis, that's what we mean. Metastasis may, basically means spreading, and then invasion means that it, uh, it, it was in the, in the, for example, the inner lining, and now it has spread to the uh, other linings or the other layers of the, of the colon. That, that's an example I gave. So that's really a lot of medical stuff. Now let's go into the real uh, stuff about prevention and so forth and what are some of the reasons why cancer comes. So what do you think are some of the factors that increase the risk of cancer? If, I, if, if, if we were uh, meeting physically, I would have asked everyone to raise their hands if they think tobacco is one of them. I am sure most of you agree that tobacco is one of them. Does diet contribute uh, to whether our uh, risk of cancer is, is there or not? Yes, it does. Does alcohol uh, contribute? Yes, it does. Does lack of physical activity contribute to increase the risk of cancer? Yes, it does. Does obesity increase the risk of cancer? Yes, it does. So in fact, all these factors that I've listed here are risk factors for colon, I mean, for development of cancer. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Now, uh, we can prevent up to a third of the most common cancers by three things yeah which which you know which is i have alluded to in this slide one maintaining healthy weight okay when i talk about a healthy weight i'm talking about a bmi of below 25 okay um uh, so 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 you, you know you calculate you take your weight and uh, you know divide that by your height and 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 that that gives you the bmi and and for most people a, a normal bmi is between 18 and 25 yeah so anything outside that if you if you are going into overweight and especially if you are going into obesity and, and and morbid obesity that's the severe grades of obesity and so forth the risk of cancer actually goes higher okay so maintaining normal weight is actually one of the ways to prevent uh you know ourselves from getting uh cancer however i have to say that uh, we leave us in our society it's not a uh, uh it's 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 a bit not very fashionable to be very lean or very thin maybe people might think you're not doing very well in life or maybe you have some problems and so forth and so on we see this a lot when patients tell us okay we tell them okay you need to lose weight and they they'll be like ah 
si watu wataona nikiwa na nikiwa mdogo sana ama people will think I'm, I'm too thin ama wataona ni watanisikilia huruma those kind of things so i think our african society does like big bodies but some of sometimes those big bodies do you know predispose us to diseases not just cancer but also other things like diabetes blood pressure uh, cholesterol and, and those kind of things the other thing is about eating uh, eating smart we'll discuss more about that and moving more so sedentary lifestyle does increase the risk of cancer um, uh, and as well as uh, you know certain types of foods which we are going to talk about shortly people who take alcohol especially excessive amounts of alcohol that does increase our risk of cancer so i know i am preaching to the converted but uh, just in case of our friends and so forth we it's important to tell them that uh, excess alcohol intake has been found to be associated with certain cancers liver cancers uh, colon cancers and so forth and so on so we want to limit the amount of alcohol we are using to not more than one drink for women and not more than two drinks for men uh then then yeah then the other one is yeah yeah uh, the other the other issue is uh, tobacco so of course smoking has been associated with many many cancers the top among them is the lung cancer is it is a cause of most of lung cancers if not uh except a few and then tobacco also has been associated with other cancers throat cancer uh, mouth cancers esophageal cancers and so forth and so on so people who smoke actually predispose themselves to uh, getting cancers and, and not just the smoker but also the guys who are doing second hand smoking these are guys who are living in the surroundings or in the vicinity of the people who smoke so so the, the families may be at risk their children may be at risk uh, you know and so forth and so on uh, there are certain occupational hazards that will predispose people to uh, uh, uh getting cancer so for example people who handle uh, asbestos which is a roofing material that used to be used uh, a while back have been found to have 10 times higher risk of developing cancer than people uh, than people than people who don't other risk factors include infections so things like hiv hiv does predispose people to getting cancer hiv reduces your immunity and your immunity is very important to keep everything at equilibrium so whenever your immunity is low then your your equilibrium gets lost and so you are able you i mean you you are prone to developing cancer than more than the person who has a strong immunity so uh, so hiv hepatitis b virus hepatitis b virus can be gotten sexually just the way hiv can be gotten hepatitis c also does predispose to liver cancer and so forth human papilloma virus so human papilloma virus is one of the cancers i mean one of the viruses that uh, that can cause cervical cancer it can cause warts it can cause throat cancers and so forth and so on so uh hpv is spread sexually and so hpv one of the things that can actually cause uh, cancers and so it's one of the infections that that can can cause that and and what we can do as parents is to have our children vaccinated especially the kids who are you know uh, just before adolescence so between 10 and uh, 14 years there both men uh, girls and boys i think for the government now they are doing a universal vaccination for boy for girls uh, all girls before they join high school and and and, and if, if your girl has not been vaccinated then it will be good to, you know to go to a place where they can get vaccinated because that will protect her from getting hpv in the future that can give them cervical cancer or can give them uh what's uh the same thing with hepatitis b hepatitis b for people who maybe uh are medical workers or people who practice have uh, maybe uh they you know have more than one sexual partner and so forth those are the guys we want uh, them to be vaccinated so that they do not get hepatitis b so we have certain immunosuppressive uh, medications that uh, like the, the medicines medicines for organ transplants and so forth those sometimes can also uh, increase your risk of cancer radiation especially from the sun it has been very hot uh, these days so excessive sun exposure does expose our skin to uv radiation and, and that may cause you know some form of skin cancers i must say that that is is a problem especially with caucasians people who have white skin uh, and so you know for them 
you know, it's important for them to wear sunscreen and so forth and so on. At least for us, uh, we have some natural protection in the form of melanin, but uh, again, excess UV is also, so, also not very good. We also have certain genetic, uh, you know, gene inherited genes or ge genetic predisposition to getting cancer. A good example would be certain breast and ovarian cancers. So if you have a family where you have uh, this sister has breast cancer, this other person has breast cancer, this other one had ovarian cancer. If you look at the genes of that family, you might find that they have a gene that actually predisposes them to getting cancer. It's called the BRCA1 and BRCA2, okay? So in fact, uh, there is one um, famous actress in Hollywood who did the test and found that she, she she had um, you know the BRCA gene, and they actually underwent a mastectomy Be, even before the cancer developed. They underwent mastectomy because it's almost guaranteed that they are going to get uh, breast cancer. So and that's why family history of cancer is very important. So if if you if you notice that there is a certain pattern, uh, especially with breast and ovarian cancer, then it's important that you be examined bring it you know bring it up with a doctor and then let them advise you uh, accordingly but family history does give a predisposition to issues to, 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 to do with cancer then how then can we prevent ourselves from getting uh you know cancer so of course number one would be avoiding tobacco uh, avoiding limiting the amount of alcohol we use uh avoiding excessive uh, sun exposure avoiding the viruses that uh, cause cancer, avoiding exposure at the workplace, for example, the asbestos, uh, you know, certain, you know, paints and lead and whatnot. Sometimes even those may predispose to cancer, like painters, they may get certain, certain whatevers. And then uh, the other habits that we, we can use to, you know, lower our risk. So in terms of diet, uh, the main diets that have been found to increase the risk of uh, you know of cancer are things like processed meat okay where so when i say processed meat think about everything sweet that we take for breakfast yeah so sausages bacon ham salami you know uh, those kind of things yeah so everything everything that we like taking is processed yeah so those are things that we that we you know that when you look at all the guidelines from the cancer associations associations and all uh you know they ask us to really limit the amount of processed meat that we are taking yeah so 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 pepperoni you know we buy pizza for our children we buy pizza for ourselves and so forth so those are some of the things we ask that that we, we limit yeah uh, 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 uh red meat has also been found uh, to, to have a, you know, a bit of, of risk of cancer, but it's not to say that we shouldn't eat, but even that we should uh, limit uh, if, if you've not been able to avoid. Uh, sugar, sugary drinks, you know, they do increase our risk of getting other diseases, not just cancer, but also obesity and so forth. And obesity does lead to issues to do with, uh, it increases the risk of getting cancer um, and so forth and so on. So processed meat, uh, red meats, um, um uh, sh sweetened uh, sugary beverages and excessive alcohol intake okay so instead we you know the advice about uh, you know in consuming uh, you know non processed meats you know so just the usual uh, kawaida uh, meat you know white meat that has just been cooked fried or 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 or, 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 um, or, or stewed and, and and so forth uh, and, you know, vegetable and fruit intake, they have good um, minerals and uh, things we call antioxidants that actually help to kill some of the cancerous cells. Exercising regularly is extremely key. Uh, so when we exercise, uh, you know, it, it has extremely many, many health, health benefits. And one of the health benefits is to reduce risk of uh, getting cancer. And then of course, going for screening and going for checkups, which we are going to, to cover uh, very shortly. Now, what are some of the signs and symptoms of cancer? Now, many times cancer may be 
may ha may be very very hard to diagnose especially in the is in the initial stage in the early stages yeah so you might get uh, you know you know, no, no symptoms or you might get just symptoms that are very very non-specific that you know it may be confused with other things okay and i'm sure many of us have had those kind of stories where uh, you know sat you know a certain person always went to hospital they were always being told this is ulcers 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 until one day someone decided to maybe do an endoscopy and they found it was esophageal cancer so uh, you know, it may be, it may be, it may, it may not have any symptoms. And so, what I would encourage all of us is, if that is that, if you have symptoms that you can't really explain, and you have gone to one doctor maybe more than two, three times, and you're not getting help, then it's important that you seek a second opinion and then have a look and see what other, or what, what you know, what other, what other opinion you may get. Uh, but other general symptoms would include things like weight loss. Uh, things like uh, you know fatigue, tiredness. You may get someone with a lot of pain. You may get changes in the skin or the eyes. You may get things like fever and so forth. So those are important symptoms for for us to be able to uh, capture when 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 patients come you know for evaluation. So and and uh, yes, and this is what I was saying that sometimes it will not it will not be it will not be something obvious. Yeah. Sometimes it will just be a something simple as a lump in the breasts, yeah? And so that, that's important for all our ladies and, and men to be then, you know, checking and seeing, uh, you know, that there's nothing abnormal uh, going on maybe in the breast or you know, in other pa parts of the body. It may be unusual bleeding, yeah? Uh, the other day, uh, around uh, December there, there was a lady that I usually see for diabetes and hypertension. She came and told me, that uh, she's 65, so she's post, mono, post, post menopause. She told me, uh, I, I, you know, I've been bleeding, you know, and uh, of course, it's very, very abnormal for a woman who's already gotten to menopause to bleed. So, you know, we had to check, and, and lo and behold, she actually had uh, stage two cervical cancer. Okay. Now, had this lady done her pap smear and so, so forth, it's likely that maybe we would have picked this much earlier okay but uh, but now she's under currently undergoing treatment for that so for her it was an issue of bleeding yeah so her bleeding was unusual so she came to me and, and said that sometimes it's an abnormal discharge yeah maybe an, an abnormal discharge sometimes it may be uh, a change in the in the in your bowel habits yeah so you might find that maybe you know before you would move your bowels maybe once a day or maybe twice a day or try or you know whatever rhythm there is and then now these days you you know that has totally changed maybe you're not going at all or you're going too frequently and so forth so sometimes it may be just very subtle symptoms that uh, may lead us to actually make that uh, 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 diagnosis so there are various good uh, uh, screening tests <clears throat> uh, that that uh, you know that that that, that and then there are very various guidelines that uh, guide us as far as screening is, is concerned and when we talk about screening screening is not the same as diagnosing yeah when we talk about screening screening means we want to check and and and, and ch uh, we want to check for the disease uh you know at a very very early stage you remember the slide i showed you about normal dysplastic uh hyperplastic and so forth so we want to check the we want to check the cells when they are in the dysplastic phase yeah so before they become cancerous and then we can do something about them so that's what screening does it detects cancer you know very early and then we can be able to treat it uh you know before it uh before it spreads and uh cancer is easy to treat early when it's stage one and below and then very difficult when it gets to stage four and, and stage three, okay? You know, it costs much more money, it costs much more time, resources, you know, quality of life, it affects that when it's diagnosed uh, much early. And so, if there's is, if is one thing that I want us to take from this talk is about issues to do with screening, okay? Now, we have, cancers affect all parts of the body, yeah, except maybe the hair, and the nails, okay? It affects everywhere else. But we only have five cancers that have been proven 
to have a good screening mechanism for them, okay? And these are the ones that I've listed here. So cervical breast, uh, prostate, colorectal, and lung. And even prostate, there are many, many issues, but I'll put, I'll, I'll you know, just put it uh, here. So when we talk about cervical cancer, uh, cervical cancer really is uh, cancer of, you know, the opening of the uterus. And how do we screen? We screen by taking a sample, okay? Taking a sample from the cervix and then pasting that sample on a slide and shipping that slide to a pathologist who will then look at those cells and decide whether they are looking normal or abnormal. If they are abnormal, we treat. If they are normal, then we uh you know we continue screening so that's one of the things okay, so for cervical cancer this is done for all sexually active women above the age of 25 we do it every two to three years and uh, we do it until the age of 65 after the age of 65 if the, the woman has had no more uh, pap smears then we don't need to continue doing but between 25 and 65, we do it throughout, uh, at least every two to three years, and we see whether there's any abnormality. So I'd request the host to mute the person who is uh, muted, just because there's a bit of uh, feedback there. Then, so that's cervical cancer. Then uh, there is breast cancer. So breast cancer, okay, so before that, I wanted to say cervical cancer, we use, we use pap smear, but we also use um, um what we call hpv testing and if you do hpv testing if it's negative then uh, you know we, if the hpv is, is negative then we, we can test the we, we can check or screen every five years okay but if it's pops me alone it's every two to three years if it is normal okay then there's breast cancer breast cancer we use mammogram what's a mammogram it's a soft x-ray it's a soft x-ray of the la of the breasts we, we usually treat people who are above i mean we usually people who have the uh and we you can see the picture there you have uh, this x-ray machine okay so that's that's yeah so so that soft x-ray there that uh, that you know detect certain cancers you can see in this image there there's a small white thing that we call application that uh, when we see this that might cancer and so we see that person for other 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 tests we have the prostate cancer prostate is a small gland that is located just below the urinary bladder so that's the there that's the bladder there and that's the urethra that comes out through the you know the, you know the, the penis so this sometimes gets cancerous okay and how do we detect this we detect we detect using a blood test called a psa so there is this gland produces a certain chemical called a psa and that's what we detect in the blood if it, there's a lot of that chemical then uh, you know it's likely that you may have some cancer if we do these tests yeah where we fill the gland through the back passage we fill the gland and feel whether it's smooth or rough or uh, irregular or painful and so forth it might also give us some bit of information as far as that is concerned so that's about prostate then color for the colorectal so these are the large intestines so we use three types of tests. We use the, uh, we, 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 did, we try to look for some blood in the stool, just because most cancers will sort of shed some very tiny amounts of blood in the stool that you cannot be able to see with your naked eye. So we look for that in the, in the lab and see whether there's anything. Then uh, we can use a, a certain, you know, stool. We, you know, we, it goes through the back passage, goes into the large intestines, and sees whether there's any any problem there. Okay, and so these are any of these three can be used for colon cancer screening. And then finally, we have the lungs. So people who are smokers, we we, we use uh, what we call a CT scan or a low dose CT scan for people who smoked heavily to detect whether there's any cancers. Uh, and so forth and so on. Now, those are the three, those are the five cancers that have proven screening tests. 
Now we have these things we call tumor markers, uh, and, and I'm sure many of you have have gotten across that. So we have certain blood tests that are called tumor markers. Uh, you know, they are called CEA, CA19, CA15, AFP, and so forth. Now I want to say that those tests, I know they are done in a, in many of our facilities. For those of you who have who have had the opportunity to go to India, they do so many tests like those and so forth. But uh, I just want to say that uh, there is a small caveat to use of those tests. Those tests are not screening tests. These are mostly used for diagnosis or for follow-up, okay? So that if someone has a certain cancer, I use that to see how the cancer treatment is, is, is taking that person. So if, if um, so, so, so I wanted to say that uh, these tumor markers, we need to be very careful uh when we are interpreting them they do not they are not sensitive enough and they're not specific enough those are medical terms but i'll just try and explain what that means it basically means that uh, we may tell you that it's normal yeah whereas there might be something brewing yeah or we may tell you that it's high whereas there is nothing okay so so these you know they are used and may, may, mainly they are used for commercial reasons so far the guidelines have not shown that they can be used for screening but maybe in the future you know evidence is going to come that 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 talks about that now uh i'll just address two more things i see our, our time is is gone so i'll just uh, i have another almost 20 something slides but i will not go through all of them i just want to make two points and then i will go to the q and a the first point is about biopsy. So biopsy, many of you who have had the issue of the biopsy. So today, just, just this morning, I had a lady come to my office. Uh, we had done a wellness checkup for her last week. Uh, we did a mammogram and the mammogram showed like there, there was some, some issue. And so she was asked to go and do an ultrasound of her breast. She did the ultrasound of the breast and that ultrasound showed that there's some, some new swelling somewhere. And so she came to me and, and of course the next point, the next thing then after that is biopsy. So I asked her, so she, she told me that uh, she's really afraid of biopsy. I told her why, because uh, she has heard that, uh, you know, biopsy does cause spread of cancer. When you do the biopsy, then the cancer spreads and then that person is likely to die and so forth. Alafu uh, wakaniambia that uh, she heard from her traditional healer, alimuambia, the traditional healer alimuambia, and so forth and so on. So basically many things. I, I could understand her concern about the biopsy because that's a, you know, that's a real concern. Uh, but also, but what was worrying also, she was telling me that, you know, that traditional person uh, usually just goes and touch, 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 touches the body part. And once they touch the body part, they're able to know whether it's cancer or, or not. Um, yeah, so it, it, it was a bit funny because this is someone who, well, it, it was a bit interesting, yeah, yeah. But 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 basically, when we, uh, you know, cancer ca is diagnosed one, when we we have to look at the tissue itself, we have to look at the cells. So so we have to do what we call a histological diagnosis. When I say histological, I mean we have to take those cells, we have to put them in a slide, and we have to look at them under a microscope. That's the way the way cancer is diagnosed. So there is no diagnosis of cancer without biopsy, okay? We cannot look at a tissue and say, okay, this is cancer. No, it has to be, we have to take a bit of sample, take it to the to the lab, check. Does, can, does biopsy cause spread? No, okay, it doesn't, okay? So that, that, that was point number one. And then point number two was about um, the whole issue of treatment. So, so the cancer treatment depends on the, cancer type and the cancer stage. So, so we, we can use surgery, we can use radiation, we can use chemotherapy, we can use uh, other forms of therapy that are coming on and, uh, and then there's palliative treatment. So if for example, someone has a uh, esophageal cancer, yeah, you have cancer of your food pipe uh, and, 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 and food is not able to go through. So I wanted to say that uh, cancer, um, Cancer, so, so surgery is, is a very key part of treatment of, of, of cancer. So many cancers, if they have not spread much, then, you know, you can have surgery. For example, 
I was giving the example of the esophageal cancer. If food is not able to go down, then usually we do a surgery, the, you know, the, the doctors involved or concerned will do the surgery, they'll remove the tumor, and then they'll do chemo or radiotherapy. If, for example, it's cervical cancer, then uh, you have to remove the diseased part and then, you know, sort of do other, 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 other modalities, right, like radiation and chemo to kill all the uh, cancerous uh, cells, okay? Now, if, if cancer has again now spread too much, it, if, it has, it, if, it's, if it is stage four, okay? And when we talk about stages, uh, I had a slide on that, yeah. So when we talk about stages, we, we mean about the spread. How far has it spread? Stage four means cancer of the liver has spread to the brain, it has spread to the lungs, it has spread to all other, uh, the intestines and so forth. That's stage four, okay? Stage one is there's very minimal spread. It's just in the primary site, okay? And then stage two, there's a bit of spread. Stage three, they are the surrounding lymph nodes and so forth. Stage four is distant uh, spread. So when it has spread a lot, sometimes it's easier not to, to treat, okay? Uh, or maybe you just give palliative treatment. And by palliative, I mean medicine not to cure you, but to make you comfortable, okay? As you live with that uh, condition. So again, that is also something that um, that happens. So I think I want to end there. Uh, I don't want to continue beyond that because I've made the points. But in summary, I just want to say that number one, uh, you know, obviously cancer, you know, we've discussed about what cancer is, you know, how, what pro what happens and so forth. But the two ta main take home messages is number one, how do we prevent ourselves from getting cancer? Basically, it starts with our, you know, lifestyles, okay? So it's about healthy eating, it's about uh, physical activity, maintaining good weight, is about, um, you know, avoiding things like tobacco, alcohol that increase our cancer risk and other other chemicals, avoiding infections like HPV, HIV, hepatitis, and so forth, and bring infections and so forth. So, so, so it's about about that. Sometimes you will do all that, but the cancer will still come. Okay, uh, because there's a lot about cancer that is still not yet known, but a lot of research is going into that. So that's the first take-home message, and then the second take-home message is screening. So it is important for us to be screened. Uh, get screened for ladies, your pap smears, your mammograms, very important. For men, prostate, okay. And for everyone, colorectal cancers and, and, and lung cancers for the guys who are smokers. And then for everyone else, just being in sync with your body, listening to your body. What is your body telling? If there's something that you don't feel, you feel that like is a bit off, then it's important for us to just go get checked, uh, you know, either get, you know, the diagnosis, get reassurance and so forth and so on. So I want to end it there. I've taken a bit of time, uh, but I, let's, I want to end it there and I want to return back the meeting to the host. Thank you, Dr. Sam Mushero for that. Uh, that was quite insightful. Uh, I think this is a very large topic for us to cover uh, in such a short period of time, uh, but uh, you have really covered very much uh, of what uh, many members here joined to hear. So you open now the space for question and answers. We'll take only uh, three questions, very burning ones, because of the aspect of time. But you can also uh, type your question in on uh, the chat uh, box, and therefore you can be able to hear, have your question. Yes, Edward, kindly proceed. Uh, first, uh, I'm a student of Mathena University, taking a Bachelor of Science in Clinical Biotechnology, and I'm asking about a question. Is there any mouth cancer like the tooth cancer or or, or the concerning issue of the throat cancer? I, I've, let, I've let in the lecture. But I just need to hear if there is uh, mouth cancer like the tooth or the gut cancer. Uh, thank you, Edward, for that. 
Okay. Uh, let, we, uh, yeah, Rene, maybe you can respond to that as we have another question after that. Thank you. Yes. So we we do have uh, oral cancers. The oral cancers they are there. They are they are they are, they are, they are yeah they are there. Oral cancers. They, so we have cancers of the gum, cancers of the tongue, cancers of the palate. Uh, uh, the tooth itself, you know, does not get cancerous, but the socket of the tooth may, you know, the, you may get cancerous and so forth. So we do have all those uh, cancers. They are they are they are present. So you know, and things like tobacco, smoking, and uh, you know, all those chemicals that sometimes people eat some of them are the ones that predispose people to uh, getting those cancers. So the cancers are there. Okay, I again open the floor for any question from... Uh, I have, I have a question. Kindly go ahead. Concerning with tooth cancer, now that a uh, uh, doctor has said there, there is like the tooth, uh, I have an issue. Me, me myself, the tooth have been... The tooth, the tooth issue affecting me. Now I've extracted two molars, and there is another one which is disturbing me. And and I've been trying things. Uh, I've been trying to sit in the hospital. I've done two exceptions, but I said it that get more knowledge on this rather than uh, extracting. How will I control uh, or how how will it, this tooth cut or how will you know specific parts that affect the tooth? It's not in mine, it's not concerned about the gum, but okay. I think I, I sort of get the question, but although and then and then now it end up bringing a lot of things. Okay. I, I, you know, you are really breaking off. I'm not exactly sure what the question was there, but uh, it seems like you are concerned about, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, like tooth cancer and so forth and so on. Um, you know, maybe we can take that offline, and maybe, uh, you know, I'll be able to sort of, uh, you know, maybe give my suggestion, um, you know, at a personal level. Yeah, that's well in order, Doc. I think we can have that. I don't kindly take uh, the email address shared on our chat box, and therefore you can get in contact with us, and we can be able to uh, link you up with Doc on that. Any other question? Kindly let's have it in. Thank yes. You. Yes. Go ahead. So, so my name is uh, Stephen Macharia. A uh, former student of technical from Technical University of Kenya, who pursued Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. Uh, so, like this month, we are like kind of creating awareness against uh, colorectal cancer. And Doc, I have a question concerning it because I got curious and decided to just go uh, through the courses, screenings, and methods of prevention. And uh, I came across an article that was saying that uh, for regular screening. It's kind of advisable for anyone with a kind of a family history about anyone who got colorectal cancer to maybe appearing in hospitals for kind of a regular check-in. And then uh, my question is, how 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 like how how likely is it that a person uh, from the range of uh, another person who had colorectal cancer uh, is likely to contract that kind of uh, disease? Yeah, are there some that have been maybe stati statistically proven? Yeah, or the, is this just uh, something, some rumors and misconceptions? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, for that question. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. When when someone in the family has had cancer, uh, the risk of the other members getting the same is higher than if that person had not had cancer. So so it's it's something that is clear. It's something that is based on evidence. Okay. In fact, for colorectal cancer, they say that uh, the screening for colorectal cancer for members of that family or the first degree relatives, that's, it, that's the, either the children or the brothers or sisters, who should be 10 years younger. So if, if for example, uh, the member of the family got cancer at uh, 50 or six, uh, let's say at 50, then the members of that family should start their screening 10 years before, so like at 40, yeah? 
uh, you know, for 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 the, the colorectal cancer. So so for for colorectal cancer, for sure. Now, if you've had a family history of the same, then uh, you will uh, predispose. Uh, you, you, you had a, if you have had a family history, then your risk is higher, and your screening should be much earlier than people who do not have. The other thing is that when studies are done, they actually place black people like me, like me, and and you at higher risk compared to white people okay so um so it's true that uh, for black our cancers come earlier and they are a bit more aggressive compared to uh, caucasians and so they advise early screening if you've had a family history and i think that's a good rule of thumb that if you've had any family history of cancer then it's important to be very in sync with your body and to always do the screening tests as soon as you know as soon as you get the opportunity to do so Thank you, Doc, for that response. Um, in the interest of time, I'll take it back to our chairman, Roy. Uh, one of the key aspects of our medical cover is that members get the chance to do screening. So, uh, Roy, please, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Shem. And thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Moshero, for that very enlightening presentation. I'm sure members have a lot of questions. Some were not able to ask, but I think uh, Dr. Shem has provided the email address where we can all address our questions. And I think Dr. Moshero, it's fair, it's only fair to say that uh, you have only done probably half of what you would have wanted to give us. And I kind of feel that we would be very privileged to ask you maybe to come and do another presentation at some other time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, Kenyan Alliance for organizing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mushero. Uh, thank you, Kenyan Alliance, for organizing to bring Dr. Mushero and IAC consultants. I think uh, we, because of in the interest of time, we would like to end there and uh, we would love want to uh, end with the words of the grace. And now may the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Kindly members, uh, the number has been shared. Uh, you can pick up the mom number in the in-call message. Uh, thank you so much for joining. May the Lord bless you.